Welcome to the Do Life Better podcast, where we believe that you get to create who you have been and who you become, and that it's often the smallest changes and actions that make the biggest difference. I'm your host, Dave Jorner, and each week I will bring you the best guests, tips, and messages to inspire and help you and me do life even better. Thank you for joining me today. Now, let's get started. Hi, friends, and welcome back to the Do Life Better podcast. And of course, thank you for choosing to spend some time with me today. And whatever it is that you are up to right now, I hope you are well on your way to creating a great day for you. And today we have another interview coming up for you. And I know that you'll get a lot out of this one. I know that I've started to make some changes in my own routine because of this chat with today's guest. And before we get into it though, you'll notice we've had a lot of interviews back to back at the moment and I'd love to know what you think about that. Have you been really enjoying having all of these interviews or would you like me to bring back some of those solo rounds? So please do let me know what you think. You can either leave a review or send me a message on Instagram at Dave Jorner or you can send me an email. Um, go into the Do Love Better podcast website, send me a message that way if you like. So again, I'd love to know what you think. Now, for today's episode, even though I work hard at eating well, exercising and making enough time for rest, I still feel that I don't have all these components dialed in well enough, at least not as much as I'd like, because sometimes I still feel too tired or foggy or just flat and really low on energy. And I'm finding it really difficult pinpointing the exact cause because there's so many different elements, so many different factors at play here, not the top of nutrition, how much sleep, how much exercise, when to exercise and all of that. So chatting with today's guest, Jason Gilbert, was a really big help for me. In fact, we started going into specific things that I should be doing each day to optimize my own health, clarity, and energy. It kind of turned into a bit of a coaching session. So I know that this will be helpful for you as well because I try to make it as relevant for you too. So again, I hope this will be helpful for you to give you some practical knowledge and tips and strategies for what you can do each and every single day to really optimize your energy, your clarity, and your overall sense of well-being. So Jason Gilbert is a biohacker. He is constantly researching the latest in health technology and new discoveries regarding the optimization of human performance and well-being. He is a sports physician for the World Surfing League. He is a chiropractor. In fact, he owns seven clinics in Peru and Brazil. And he's author of the book, which is in three different languages. It's called The Secret of the Healthy Spine. He's a motivational speaker. He's, in fact, a TV presenter on Fox Life in Brazil. He's a health coach. He's a detoxification specialist and a certified yoga teacher. And as I mentioned before, we dive deep into the different elements that will help you create an optimal level of health and well-being and clarity so that you can create a better day today and then tomorrow and then keep on improving day in and day out. Please make sure you take a screenshot of this episode. Tag Jason at Jason Gilbert underscore. Okay, that's at Jason Gilbert underscore. Tag me as well at Dave Jorner and at Do Love Better Podcast. So for now, let me introduce you to Jason Gilbert. Jason, thank you for your time on the Do Love Better Podcast today. Hey. You're welcome, mate. It's a pleasure to be here and speaking with you about health. Yeah, for sure. And actually speaking of that, um, as we first got onto the, the call, we were talking, we we're geeking out a lot on nutrition and young people and so on. And we got to the point where we we're thinking, hang on, we should probably start this interview right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, really keen to, again, you know, it's nice to, to chat with someone who has similar passion, you know, similar interest of helping young people do their life even better through enhancing various areas of their health. So um, yeah, really keen for this chat today, Jason. Same, mate. And um, it's funny, as you said, we were speaking before the the podcast or the recording, but you know, with health and passion, you can speak about it all day. And uh, especially oh, yeah. when you talk about young people and how they're in desperate need of health attention, you know, because we're not born uh, with the instructions on how to look after our health. So it's, it's an exciting thing to, to educate young people about how they should look after theirs. Mm. Oh, for sure. And not only is that something we have in common about wanting to help young people, but also um, there seems to be a bit of a surf- surfing theme happening with this podcast at the moment. Uh, so our most recent released episode was with Matt Griggs, 
and you know, he's a, a surfing coach. He's really big into meditation and mindfulness. And and you how you are currently a sports physician for the World Surfers. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, mate. I, I'm a sports physician with the World Surfing League, and I have been for the last twenty years. So yep. working on uh, all the surfers many times. You know, during that time, and I guess the ones that are more conscious about their health and their function more mm. than the, my role also as a sports physician just to improve their function when they're fine and help them when they have injuries to get back and complete uh, a heat uh, at their best level so it's a definitely a, it's, a, it's a very important part of any surf competition yeah so how did you get involved in that i'm a surfer firstly and i love surfing and always have and um when i was at university i volunteered to go and help out at the Co Classic back in the day, and that was what what year was that? Like ninety yeah. two, and then I went on a surf trip to South America. Uh, that's actually where I set up camp as a chiropractor, mm-hmm. and uh, ended up helping start the first chiropractic course in South America in Sao Paulo. Wow! And Brazil's always hosted one of the world events, so I got in contact with the organisers there, and uh, started to cover the events there. And in that time, the the surfing, the medical, I should say, the medical part of the surf sure improved drastically. Um, so now we've got a really good organisation and structure and it's improved out of sight, for sure. Fantastic. And I believe you are on or have been on national TV over in Brazil as well on the Emotional Health Program. How did that happen? Yeah, mate. So um, I guess someone like yourself recognises the importance of educating people about health. And when I um, opened my first clinic in Lima, Peru, I knew that there were many people needing what I was offering, but, you know, unless I told them that what I did, they weren't going to find out. So I I used television as a way of um, transferring that, you know, and getting on television and talking and doing all sorts of interviews. And so that was first in Spanish in Peru and then years later in Brazil in Portuguese. So after many years of being interviewed, it also coincided the audition with uh, me releasing a book. Uh, I launched a book called The Secret of the Healthy Spine in Mm -hmm. Portuguese. And um, this invite came, it was a funny story actually, an invite came to participate in this program. And I actually thought that I'd be a consultant on spinal management because I was always, that's what I was always talking about, like correct posture, um, how to study, how to sleep, how to do the housework, all of these sort of things, how to care for the spine. And um, we've gone down to Argentina from Brazil to film at the Fox Studios and they've come up and said, no, actually, you're the presenter of the program. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it would have been nice to know earlier because I would have done like a course in presenting. But <laughs> look, I, I, I was quite comfortable in front of the, the camera and my job was to interview um, doctors mm-hmm. about certain aspects of health and also present my segment on spinal health. And it was a great experience, really good experience. So, so I'm... I'm I love, I guess, educating people, whether it be podcasts or written media, social media, television. You know, it's, it's, it's a really effective way of reaching people. Yeah. And how did you first get passionate about this idea of health and well-being? Good question. There's a few influences back in the day. One was uh, a teacher at school. We, mm-hmm. we actually had health. Uh, health as a subject, and it was probably when we were around year seven. And I remember this teacher one day put up just a diagram of an artery with atherosclerosis, and under that, the sort of foods like fast foods and fried foods that would contribute to that. And next to it, a healthy artery, nice and clean, with you know healthy foods under that. And I remember just being young and that having an impact, going, you know, I don't want that. So that was definitely the first thing, and then. A couple of years later, my family bought a health food store in Manly, Sydney, and I, was, I always worked there on the weekend. So through that, I came in contact with incredible people, uh, not only clients that were interesting. That, I was always fascinated by healthy elderly people because I'd, I'd ask them what their tricks were and I'd notice what they'd buy religiously to maintain their health like that. But I'd also meet uh, interesting health professionals and alternative professionals that had come in and share their knowledge as well. Um, I'd say those two things were definitely the most uh, influential. But from a young age, I also accustomed, I was accustomed to feeling back pain always, always after surfing, running, playing rugby. And I just thought it was normal. Um, and I found out later in life, I actually had one leg that was shorter than the other. It was a small difference. But mm-hmm. that's what caused the pain to always be on one side of my body. So as I tell people, you know, young people, when they come in, the younger you are when you find out, the better because... 
it's not only uh, going to avoid you from unnecessary suffering in the future and unnecessary degeneration, but when you're younger and that sort of an influence, um, I guess, can help you realise how to live your life, it's also going to impact in your life in many other positive ways as well. The other really important thing was through the health food store, I'd get the magazines and learn about, you know, what was going on in the world of health. And one of them uh, actually focused on the importance of mm-hmm. removing any mercury feelings that you might have had and the dangers of that. Mm-hmm. And one day I rang up at just my local dentist who I'd always gone to and I said, mate, can you remove these, remove these feelings? And it was incorrectly done. There's a full process that you need to follow, not only for the patient not to be intoxicated by mercury, but also the, the dentist. And I had severe toxicity that only came out a couple of years later. When I say severe, it was severe, like GI tract problems, um, incessant diarrhea, headaches, fatigue, um, insomnia, and nothing that I could do through traditional lab tests or allopathic medicine was useful in helping me identify what was going on. So once again, that sort of sets you off on a path. It's like a crossword. Each person, when they get sick, has their own little personal challenge there to find out the factors that caused it. But in that time, I came in contact with amazing doctors from all around the world. Some of them were my patients in Brazil, and that helped a lot because they'd invite me to their courses and I'd learn about functional medicine. But the most important thing was that I learned through detox. I learned about how, how bad and toxic uh, heavy metals are in your body and the methods that you need to utilize to, to remove them. So I'd say those four factors are probably the most predominant, plus the fact that from every patient that comes in, you learn from, you know, you're learning the whole time as a, a practitioner. Yeah, nice. Now, if you could keep on doing only one, so if it had to be either TV presenter or working as a um, working with the surfers or in your, um, in your local practice, if you could only do one of those, which one would you go all in on? Oh, mate, look, you get to a stage of life where when you realise what your life purpose is and when you're, you're practising that, when you're working towards it, nothing else is that interesting compared to the, the gratification you get from that. So definitely working with people mm. as opposed to uh, just a certain type of person like an athlete or you know, television, even though that's really good fun too. Definitely <laughs> yep. work with people one-on-one or we're doing retreats, for example, or workshops. Education is really important because that's really what helped me. So yeah, that's, nice. that's the way that I can help change people's lives in with the strongest impact. Awesome. Just seeing that that change. Like for me, when I do our programs, what keeps me going is those aha moments, seeing the, the spark of light go off in them, you know, in terms of a, a deeper sense of realisation. Um, you know, even in like what you were speaking about before with the health and well-being, you know, we do these things not realising that they're detrimental to our health. And we want to be healthy, we want to have smart choices, but we actually don't know that what we're eating or doing is causing us harm. And then once we get the right knowledge, then we are able to make that change. So, you know, in terms of your wants to do that one-to-one work and see that deeper connection and the retreats and so on, um, you know, that's something that I'm deeply passionate about as well, you know, just working with people long-term and, and helping them create that change. So, yeah, nice one. And, you um, know, as I said, like, uh, it's, it's sometimes it's very surprising to see the impact of a quick chat yeah. One little bit of advice and the huge impact that has on someone's life, you know, in the next week it might impact that much. But when you take that over years or decades, that, that's massive, you know, that might prolong someone's life. It might keep them living younger, longer. Um, it might, you know, it might result in many, many possibilities. But that education is so important. That is so important. It's not happening enough. And even when people do want to learn about health, where do they go? Like m- most of what we call health or health professionals or most of the terms that health is associated with, like the Ministry of Health or Health Insurance, are actually focused on disease. And when you think about like that mm. health insurance, all, you know, health insurance like car insurance, it'll pay for if car insurance is useful if your car's stolen or damaged. Health insurance is pretty much the same. You know, there's very few things that are preventative 
or focus on function. Most health insurance is useful when we've already lost our health. You know? um, so should the word health be used for that? You know, Ministry of Health, you know, a lot of times you see a lot of focus on the cure for cancer, but look, if you've already got cancer, you've lost your health, so why don't we focus on that first and try and avoid that? Yeah. So that's what I found myself. Like when I started to learn, you're like, hang on. This is that big and that important. Why aren't more people speaking about it? Oh, for oh. sure. It's like it's awesome to see the work positive psychology is doing now, which focuses on the positive things you can add into your life to increase your mental health and well-being. And as you're saying, we need to do more of that in the other areas of our health. It's not about just go and focus on your health when it starts going wrong and when you're ill and you're sick and so on, but learning more to educate yourself so that you can be more proactive and and reduce the need of going to see a doctor because you're sick or having ill health or whatever. One of the things you mentioned before about the, the mercury toxicity is I've been reading a book called Food, What the Heck to Eat by Dr. Mark Hyman. And one of the things I've been reading in that is just how bad mercury is for your body and how many foods we actually consume mercury through such as tuna like i've been eating canned tuna for a long time thinking it's great for me but turns out it might not be um and you mentioned before about those heavy metals in our body so how can we avoid taking on things like mercury and those other metals hey, that's a really good point first i'll just relate my experience with tuna um back in the day when i thought also i tuned protein i was traveling so i was having heaps of tuna and i actually noticed my hair was starting to fall out oh yeah yeah, and we talked about this before the podcast started about being lucky if you get the symptoms. Mm. That's an example. Like my body was sensitive to it and it showed me. Now, as you said, mercury is everywhere. And mercury, if you look at... Most people would say that uranium is probably the most dangerous element you can be exposed to. But you, uranium is actually stable in certain forms. Mercury is not stable in any form. So you could think, okay, well, I've got solid mercury fillings, um, but what about when you have a hot drink or what about when you grind your teeth? So there's people can go onto YouTube and they can see videos of just like a rubber and a razor going over a, a piece of mercury and seeing vapors come off that. Oh, what we've got yeah. to realise is that that is not stable in any form and when it's in our body, if we're smelling something or if a vapor is being inhaled, it's, it's the same as ingesting, okay? If something's going on your skin... Okay, the pores of your skin let 60% of everything you put on your skin go into your body, straight into the circulation. So if you eat something, at least it can go via your stomach or your mouth first and have saliva and other enzymes and then your stomach with stomach acids and other enzymes. So it can be broken down or diluted a little bit, but the skin is a direct entrance when the chemicals get through. Now, mercury is just one of many heavy metals and toxins that gets more attention because it's obviously the most toxic. And it's, it's one of those things like aluminium is also like this. It's, it's in many, many uh, I guess, things that we're exposed to. Um, and as such, it's, it's disguised. We wouldn't think to think of it, wouldn't imagine like looking for mercury in certain products. But look, we can look at our domestic cleaning products, for example, and see how many chemicals are in there. We've got to realise now different to 100 years ago, 200 years ago, or tens of thousands of years ago when our genetic model, as we are now, was finished, that, hey, we weren't exposed to these chemicals. And now there's 130,000 chemicals that we know of. And when these chemicals bind, they also create other chemicals with other characteristics. So if we think that everything that goes into our body is going to be passing out, that's definitely not, not applicable because it's not you know, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. So the importance of removing heavy metals and toxins as fast as you can is paramount. And um, it's something that I, I highlight with people that we've got this, I guess, this notion of um, brushing our teeth every day to maintain dental health. Mm. But I truly, through my own experience and what I'm seeing with other people I'm working with is that we all need to employ detox strategies every day, every day. And that means for some people hydrating more because hydration is a very basic, but very, you know, the first way that our cell can detox and it's hard and we're, we're, we're not hydrated. It could be sweating. 
You know, go and speak to the general public these days. How many people, what percentage of the population is sweating, which is a really important detox method. And there's other things that are sort of less necessary that, um, sorry, not less, less obvious, I should say, that mm-hmm. can be done as well. Um, so I know I've talked a little bit about that now, but that for me is something because I've been through that personal experience and I know how hard it is to remove heavy metals. I'd say, look, we don't want to wait to the, the results of heavy metal toxicity show themselves because that can often be too late. It can be Alzheimer's, it can be other degenerative illnesses, it can be you know, multiple sclerosis, it can be any number of many illnesses that we think if we're not, I guess, programmed to understand that, oh, that's just a normal part of life, you know, or that's mm. unavoidable. Of course it's avoidable. If I could just keep speaking a little bit on this point, Dave, what I, what I, when we talk to people, we, we always start by saying, look, what, what are, think of what the five most important things in your life. And people will say, okay, well, you know, family, playing my sport, you know, my, my, my husband, my wife, my kids, my relationship with God, whatever it is, but most people don't put health on that list. Mm, and then sure. when, you, when you say, well, look, take one of those things you just mentioned or take everyone and now tell me how that would be if you weren't healthy. How would your relationship be if you weren't healthy? Think about a time that you were sick or that you had a broken leg or a sore back or whatever. How how did you deal with that? How did that affect other people in your life? Did you work well? Did you play your sport? you know, or exercise. So they soon realize, oh, yeah, wow, health should be more important than what I'm, you know, how I'm putting in the list there of priority. And then we say, okay, well, you've, you've recognized that health is important, but now if it's important, wouldn't it be important to understand what it is? So when you go and you ask people, what is health? Tell me what your definition of health is. Most will say, oh, it's how I feel or how I look. This whole thing of judging our health on how we feel Think of uh, how many people wake up feeling great and they die later on that day of a heart attack. You know, if their parameter of uh, cardiac health was, you know, how they feel, well, that was the wrong parameter. They ultimately ended up in their, in their, their death, you yeah? know. And think mm-hmm. of how many people that, um, for example, base their health on how they look. Well, I'm thinking someone like Patrick Swayze, who was stage four pancreatic cancer, and he was looking pretty good not long before he died. So they're not really good parameters to judge whether they're healthy or not. Okay, so what I educate people on is, hey, health is when the cell, your cell, every cell of your body is functioning 100% correctly. Uh And there's a word for that, it's called homeostasis. So that's when the cell is functioning 100% correctly. So why I'm taking the time to explain this is because it's a really easy shift for most people if they understand, okay, well, now I know that my cell is healthy and I'm healthy, consequently, when it is functioning 100% correctly, well, what have I got to do to maintain cell function 100%? Uh That's easy as well. Your cell needs its its adequate amount of nourishment, nutrition, and that includes the correct proportion of protein, carbohydrates, the right sort of fats, saturated fatty acids, minerals, vitamins, etc. And it cannot be exposed to or it has to be exposed to a minimum amount of toxins so then what you've got here you've got you know two sides to a page one side nourish or nutrients one side toxins and then most people can sit down and go well what are nutrients what are the ones you're exposed to and then they can write them down then you can go over ones that are less obvious like the sun the sun is a really important nutrient enough of it now we need the sun okay we we can't have too much of it obviously but that's like the rule of life Uh, What else is on that list? Sleep. Movement, in my opinion, movement is one of the, well, if not the most important nutrient because it is absolutely vital for the function of our cerebellum, which is the brain of the brain. The people thought for years the cerebellum was just a motor center, but it actually is a homeostatic center of the brain. So movement's up there, you know. Um, What would be a toxin? Negative emotion, okay, anger. Jealousy. So those emotions of stress are really important. Okay, what, what else would be a toxin? Sedentary lifestyle. Mm. What else? Lack of sun. Okay, then you can go to the more obvious ones like the mercury or the gluten or the dairy or whatever. But when that person has a consciousness of what is good and what is bad, 
then at least if they make those decisions along the way, it's a conscious decision. Yeah. That's when they're actually going, yeah, look, I know this isn't good for me. I know that, you know, fried chips cooked in uh, trans veggie oil uh, isn't good for me, but okay, this time I decide to do it. Which is a lot different to someone who eats something totally, totally oblivious to the negative effects it could have or just in that anger cycle or whatever emotional influences that are keeping them from enjoying full health, you know? So going back, I know that took a long time to explain, but I really want to exemplify um, the importance of that conscious, I guess, the consciousness that someone needs to have if they want to stay healthy. And it's not that hard. It really isn't. Yeah. And it can sometimes be those one percenters changing one little thing can make a big difference. So change one thing, see the difference it makes, then go on and change another thing. So as you said, whether it be the sleep or the movement or um, spending time in mindfulness or meditation to help with those those feel-bad emotions like anger and so on. And then particularly with food. So I've been trying to eat much better these days and I've been having smoothies for breakfast for a long time. But I'd find that I'd feel great afterwards but then, you know, I'd probably have it at about 7, between 7 and 7.30 a.m. in the morning. I do exercise beforehand, have a protein shake, have my smoothie. But then as I'm setting up for a program, I need to eat something again between like 8 and 8.30 because otherwise by 10 o'clock, it's as if my blood sugar level is really low and I'm shaky and my head's all over the place. And then it wasn't until later someone said, how about you put some avocado in there? or some coconut oil, and that made a big difference. Exactly. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask, what you put in your shakes, because for me, like you tell me that without knowing exactly, we know that your blood sugar levels are spiking pretty quickly, mm. so it's the wrong sort of fuel you're putting in there, and if you put the right sort of fuel in there, like saturated fatty acids, as you said, avocado, coconut oil, etc., then you don't get the spike. You know, it's got a... I guess a, a GI index that it's going to be uh, the energy is going to be slower and last for longer. Mate, it's interesting you say that. Like, I've been intermittent fasting now for quite a few years, mm-hmm. and when I first started, and this is the case with my clients as well, when they start, they think that they're going to suffer. Oh, but you know, I can't get through brekkie, you know, and I wake up hungry. But when they start to eat the correct dinners and the correct way during the day, they notice as I did too, that they actually don't feel hunger anymore. Yeah, you're right. eating because it's more consciously because you need to eat or because you know why and when you should eat as opposed to being a slave to your hunger because your hunger is so easily influenced by foods that will raise the insulin levels and have them drop really fast. Whereas when they go onto the saturated fatty acids, they can go, well, you know, I went 16 hours without eating. I haven't lost weight. I've gained muscle mass. I can think clearer. And wow, you know, like in general, my health improved even though I'm eating twice a day. Yeah, well, thanks for mentioning this because actually I'd love to ask you about it because my brother and his wife have gone into the bulletproof coffee craze and so they do the intermittent fasting as well. They don't eat, they try not to eat between I think it's 6 p.m. at night and uh, about 10 a.m. in the morning. Now they've lost a lot of weight. And without really increasing exercise whatsoever, and they have a greater sense of clarity and energy throughout the day. My and and I've tried that the bulletproof style coffee where you have you know some grass fed butter in there and coconut oil and and that and I have felt clearer in the mornings and I've had better energy throughout the day. But my concern is, is my body then missing out on much needed nutrients? from things like fruits and salads and veggies if I'm actually missing out on a full meal that day? Yeah, so that, that's a really good point. It's what most people, including myself, you know, went through when I made that, that decision to try it. But look, when you go back to think about what is the purpose of sleep, sleep is regeneration, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what have we done that actually requires feeding ourselves as soon as we get up. We haven't been physical. Most of the work's been, you know, on a neurological level, right? Mm. But if we realise that and we get over this idea of, hey, hang on, most people when they eat too, they're not that hungry in the morning, but 
because they work at nine and they wake up at seven, they've got to squeeze Brecky in there somewhere. So it's like yeah. more of a decision based on, you know, something we're used to or what society does, as opposed to giving their body what it needs when it does. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is that we are genetically accustomed to fasting. Okay, when you think about it, go back hundreds of thousands of years ago when at a time when we couldn't plan our next meal, we were totally, totally accustomed to that. So if there's any problem these days, it's from overeating and not, not undereating. Mm-hmm. You know, we're in a society where we're overeating and undernourished because what we are eating when we do eat isn't contain the, the nutrients that are, you know, genetically required to maintain homeostasis or cellular health. Um, and look, on a, you know, my experience, I guess on that one, it is, yeah, wow, surprising. Hey, hang on. I'm getting up, I'm surfing, I'm exercising, I'm doing high intensity stuff. I'm going to 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm still not hungry. But then when I do eat, I'm consciously eating like eggs full of um, saturated fatty acids and protein and, you know, the right sort of foods. And then I'll mm. eat another early dinner again. Wow, how, how could it be that I've increased muscle mass but lost body fat? You know, and I'm not hungry and I can think better and perform better. So, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't put that into any category of a specific diet. It's just basically giving my body what it needs and I'm challenging the old three meals a day philosophy that we've had during our whole lives, basically. Awesome. And I believe the theory behind, one of the theories behind intermittent fasting is, again, it helps to process uh, all the nutrients and everything within your body um, and then you know, pass it through your system and so that it uh, leaves you clearer. So your mind, because um, obviously, you know, the food is data for your body and, and your mind and your brain. So your brain's not clouded with all that stuff. It helps to just clear it out. Yeah, is that, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a couple of things to remember there. That digestion is a mm-hmm. very high uh, energy process. It demands a lot of energy. Oh, yeah, of course, yep. For example, if someone has a chronic illness, Mm-hmm. They're much better going for liquid nutrition over solid nutrition that they have to chew firstly and then yep. allow their um, digestive system to put a lot of effort into digesting it. So mm. things like soups and organic vegetable juice, perfect. They're really high in nutrients, very little effort and energy consumed to digest them. Away you go. Um, and, yeah, you also mentioned fasting. Look, there's... A guy called Pilot Coleman, people can look him up. He, he's pretty impressive with his work and all that he's done with fasting, that cells, when they go through a state of fasting, it doesn't have to be that long, start to actually expel toxins. Okay, the body, as I just mentioned, instead of investing that energy in digestion, is actually investing the energy in healing. Mm-hmm. So you don't want anyone in that state spending a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of time, <laughs> And energy digesting, you want them, you know, with that 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 energy put into healing. Yeah. Or yeah, awesome. if you're not sick, putting that into improving in performance. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so Jason, if I can, <laughs> let's go pretty prescriptive here right now. So what what should I be doing? Okay, so I first thing in the morning I get up, I have a glass of water or two to rehydrate. And then I do some exercise, whether it be a run like this morning or high intensity. Then I have a protein shake and then I have a smoothie and then like healthy lunches and stuff. But if so, if I'm going to be doing exercise in the morning, all right, should I be having protein shake afterwards or, you know, what should my intake of food and, and protein and that look like from exercise in the morning onwards? Okay. Yeah. Good question. There. So let's go back to that water. You said you wake up and have a glass of water or two. Yep, yep. Uh, what you see through my blood analysis is that most people are dehydrated when they think they're hydrated. So mm-hmm. we've gone six to eight hours, hopefully eight, sleeping. And in that time, most of us don't drink water. Mm-hmm. If we went that time during the day, we would be dehydrated. So we have yeah. to wake up understanding we're dehydrated and hydrate accordingly. One glass is not going to cut it. What I've done over the years, and I find it really helps, you know, I wake up, I get a lemon, ginger, garlic, and um, turmeric. And I put it in a blender and I'm drinking at least a litre of water, at least sometimes wow. a litre and a half. I take my, my time to do it. Okay, usually in that time, obviously, you're, the frequency of your urinate and the hour or two after it's going to increase. But that's okay. That's also a detox. Mm-hmm. 
when you exercise, so exercise is the way we exercise and how exercise has been challenged quite a bit uh, on a level of physiology in the last, let's say, five to ten years. Exercise should never leave you more tired after than what you were before. Okay, so in the morning, if you're going to go and do a 10 or 15K run, obviously, on an empty stomach, it's, not, it's going to be a stress. So it's not going to be beneficial at all. So in the morning, if you're going to do something, it'll be, you know, like high intensity. If you go to surf, fair enough, the surf would be, I don't know, half an hour, an hour, whatever. But it would be to the point where it's not actually putting your body in a state of stress. And that means when your body starts to secrete cortisol, mm-hmm. and cortisol, when it elevates, will also take insulin with it. So you'll get all these other negative effects of fat. So I'd say high intensity in the morning, you follow that up with, you know, your, your, your meal at time, fats and protein. So you get a look at your eggs. You mentioned a protein shake. Really look at the type of protein you're ingesting. A lot of the whey powder is full of garbage. So really make sure that it comes from a good pure source and the manufacturer you trust. So what would be a good source? Mate, a good source is, um, I guess, whey from grain-fed cows, for example, or mm-hmm. uh, a company that you know puts a lot of pride into their quality. Uh, a lot of them have fillers. A lot of them have uh, soy protein, for example. Soy, you want to stay away from soy, especially in high doses like that. Um, also, our requirement, most people's requirements for protein are a lot less than what they realise. So okay. you might actually get that amount through eggs. You know, raw eggs, for example, I was having for years, I still do, raw eggs in your blender. You know, so you're getting your protein and your saturated fatty acids at once. It's easily digestible straight down. You know, and also if you're exercising, why are you exercising early? Do you got to go to work? Is that right? Or you just prefer to do that as soon as you get up? Yeah, yeah. so I do it uh, as soon as I get up before I go to work because I feel that it helps get my mind going for the day. It helps release the endorphins and helps me think clearer. So it puts me in a much better state of mind for the day ahead. So that's why I tend to do it in the morning. And mate, tell me, um, when you run, is it mm. and how long do you, are you running for? So at the moment, I'm not training for anything. So it's generally about 6Ks. Okay. Try, throw a few sprint sessions in there and compare the way you feel after it mm-hmm. compared to, you know, your 6K run. Because in the last couple of years I've done that, I've gone back to, you know, doing my eight minutes of eight 30-second sprint, for example, with a minute rest in between. And I'm getting a lot more out of it. You know, because with our exercise, this is sort of deviating a little bit, but it's important for people to understand that we've got more than one muscle fiber. Okay, so we've got the type 2B fibers are the ones that are responsible for, they're the fast twitch fibers, mm. and they're the ones that are responsible for secreting growth hormones. So, for example, you look at a sprinter compared to a long-distance runner, how, how's the physique? How's their body? The sprinter's, like, amazingly well-built, right? Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. There's no lack of growth hormone in that body, but... Look at a long-distance runner. A long-distance runner's body is often, you know, the sort of guy who's or girl who's struggling to um, hold lean muscle mass and mm. uh, really needs to eat. So that's the first thing that shows you, hey, you don't... We have to stop equating benefit with duration, okay? Mm-hmm. Secondly, we have to include exercises into our routine that stimulate the type 2 fibre, and very few do. Uh, sprinting is one of the best. You can get onto a stationary exercise bike and just really go full, full on for 30 seconds, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, another one, a good one's boxing as well. It's very fast. You know, boxers often have, have that benefit. But other than that, mm-hmm. look, think about technology. We're talking about a whole body vibration, something like power plate that vibrates 60 times a second and directly stimulates the fiber. Now, when you go past that and you go to these exercises like jogging and whatever, and there's been a, a tendency to avoid them when we're looking at, you know, benefits for health, just due to the fact that they're stimulating type 1 fibres and not stimulating growth hormone and stimulating the the secretion of cortisol and insulin. Um, So once again, if you love running, and I used to run and I used to love it, but I never used to run and feel really good after it. And a lot of runners will say that. But when I went to sprinting, I feel amazing after it. You know, when, when I go to high intensity in the morning, I feel amazing. Well, I'll have to try that. Yeah, and so the way I eat is actually, it differs according to what exercise I do. Right, so then if I'm going to try the fasting, would I then, if I'm exercising even before six in the morning, for example, if I then have a protein shake, that interrupts the fasting. So 
Like, what do you do there? Good point. In your situation, probably would be a little bit different because, you know, you choose to exercise at that time, but that's okay. Um, what I'd be doing there is I'd just be looking at foods that are not going to spike your insulin at all, but you probably want to put a, an energy source like saturated fatty acids in there. So you mm-hmm. could do, like, the shakes I'm doing, and they're, they're fine for me for till lunch if I exercise early, are, um, I guess, coconut milk, okay, with a whole avocado, uh, nuts, eggs, cacao, which is excellent, really. It's full of polyphenols, which are really important for energy metabolism. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else do I put in there? Cacao needs, and I put a coconut flake. So you mm-hmm. can try that for a while and see how you go on that. And then mm-hmm. make your protein a little later. Like around lunchtime, you go your meat, chicken, fish, hopefully, you know, organic or grass-fed or whatever and not farm fish, if you eat fish, with your veggie and salad, and then repeat that, you know, later on in the day. And if you, I guess with our bodies and health, it's all about trialling. It's about understanding the theory and applying it to ourselves and see how we go with it. Awesome. Thanks. I want to try that because I've been focusing a lot on the protein in the morning and then like the berries and stuff like that and the smoothies. So I'll increase the healthy fats. But um, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. No problem. Okay, so what could be some other things that we could be really mindful of? Now, before we started recording, I'd, I'd spoke about how when I was at uni for my exams, I'd have like a can, a bottle of Coke and a Mars bar thinking that would help me get through. <laughs> but then I'd absolutely crash at the hour and a half mark. So I have to try to finish my exam in 90 minutes instead of two hours. Um, so some things we thought worked really don't. What could be some... Uh, basic things that we can start doing now that could make a a really big difference for us? Okay, yeah, great question. Um, I'll go back to hydration. Mm -hmm. Really important. Good quality water and enough of it. So when we wake up, too many of us go for coffee and not for hydration, so the coffee will, you know, further dehydrate us. So Mm -hmm. good hydration, you're good on that. Now, energy, as an energy source, You've got to understand that sugar and anything like Coca-Cola or fizzy drinks or whatever, they're going to spike the insulin really fast. They also contain a lot of sugar. Okay, now sugar decreases our immunity, decreases the amount of white blood cells. We don't want that, you know, it increases inflammation. And what I'm seeing is that if we are inflaming cells of our body continually during our life, although we might feel a lot at the time, that chronic low-grade inflammation that eventually leads to disease and other pathologies is the inflammation that removes our body's energy from immunity. So instead of putting that that energy to healing and to boosting the immune system, it's actually there continually fighting inflammation. And that's what people probably know when they've heard about like leaky gut syndrome or why should I avoid gluten or lactose or sugar or whatever. Mm -hmm. So avoid those foods. Fats are incredible. Like, you mentioned training before. Let's imagine you do want to go for that run. We know a couple of uh, tablespoons of coconut oil before the run. Fantastic. It's liquid. Right. It's usually stimulated, and it's a great energy source. It's a slow-burning energy source. Yeah. Have, have that straight by itself or with something else? Yeah, by itself if you want. You know, if you can't stomach that, well, you know, you could put it in a little blender. You know, if you're going right. to, if you're organized and you had time, you know, if you had it. What I do, for example, I'm going to train in a little while. So I've already had my avocado, my coconut oil, my coconut milk in the shake probably about an hour, an hour and a half ago. So I know that that's a really good energy source for me when I go and train now. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the morning, if you don't have that time, don't be afraid of training on an empty stomach. You just don't want to train for too long. And that training could be even weights. You know, there's been a full swing now to looking at high intensity training or weight training, but going in there and going to failure, but doing very few reps and for a short amount of time. That's the way out the human body was stimulated genetically hundreds of years ago. Okay. So we can't equate gain with duration. Mate, what other tips can I give you? You know, let's go back to uh, meditation you talked about. Wow. My life improved enormously with meditation and breath work. Breath work is another thing that's changed my, the way I deal with things. Being present is so important. We've all been through times in our life where we're not that present. We've got our minds running at 100 kilometers an hour. We might go to sleep and have those thoughts as well and our sleep quality suffers. So 
anything like meditation or breath work or yoga or time in nature that keeps us present is going to have massive benefits in the future. Actually, not only the future, now and the future. Mm. Programming our minds not to be, you know, preoccupied by non-consequential thoughts. Okay, because most of it really is non-consequential. They're not important things where they're just dwelling on things or stewing on things or going over things that won't make a difference at all at 10 o'clock at night compared to 8 o'clock in the morning. Exactly. Uh, uh, exercise, yeah, we'll go back to that. Just exercise. We all need to do more exercise. Most of us aren't doing enough. We need to do something every day. Walking is a great exercise. Too many of us think that we don't get a great benefit out of walking, but don't think that at all. Because a lot of people just, who don't exercise don't really want to go and jump into a gym or a pool and they don't realize that walks is a great exercise. So, you know, that is actually one exercise that you do gain on duration because it's not high intensity. It's a very low intensity exercise. You just don't want to do moderate intensity exercise for a long amount of time. Um, but walking being low intensity is fine. Uh-huh. Um, another tip I'd give people, never ignore any pain or symptom. Too many of us do that. We take a medication to suppress it or we just ignore it and put up with it. Your body's really intelligent and it's just like a car. We wouldn't obviously ignore the warning light of the car telling us there's no oil. We'd know what the consequence would be burning the, the motor. So there's the same things in our body. Always take any symptom and use it as a, an opportunity to find the actual cause of the problem and focus on improving that. Otherwise, we will get to a point where our body's just not going to deal with it anymore. It'll, it'll actually cost more in time and money to fix than what it would have originally to, to focus on and change. I mean, that could be a little gut ache after a certain sort of food. It could be an allergy. It could be whatever. You know, it's just listening to the signs of your body and dealing with them instead of suppressing them some other way. Yeah, so true. Like even when you're talking about, in terms of the cost, when you're talking about your shakes and smoothies and, and your diet, like that's expensive foods, yeah? Like the avocados are expensive, um, eggs, the coconut oil, that's all expensive stuff. And I put, you know, walnuts in mine, they're not cheap either. And some people kind of balk at the cost guns because it's going to cost me too much. But then when you look at what's the cost if you don't, what's the cost of eating bad food, then you end up going to the doctors and you miss out on work and all this stuff. It's actually cheaper to spend the money to get the good food to make sure that you maintain that good health. For sure. I mean, that's a really good point. You know, organic veggies cost more. They don't cost that much more because when I go and buy mine, I do a lot of um, cold-pressed juices and I do that daily because that's just an amazing source of all your vitamins and minerals and enzymes. But, you know, like I can go in there and I'll see certain veggies that might be out of season that I mightn't buy, but I'll look at, you know, what is in season, what is cheaper, and I'll buy that. Um, and even if I pay a little bit more to eat like that, Mate, firstly, the increase in my performance and productivity, what value do I put on that? Do you know what I mean? How much are oh, yeah, more productive? And if I was in, you know, like a business where that was directly proportioned to the amount of money I made, well, obviously that would compensate for the investment in the more expensive foods. But it could be, okay, well, I'm going to eat garbage food that is only really consumed to please my taste buds because no other cell of my body wants it. But eventually I'll be taking like a antacid or some other medication for a stomach ulcer or some other one for constipation. Okay, well, you know, that's more expensive than that little slight increase in the amount of, um, that, now that I pay for organic veggies. So, yeah, when you think that, as you said, just try and see it in, in the other side, the other side of the story and, and the benefits and you'll realise that it's not expensive at all. You know, how much does cancer cost? It's incredible, but... Cancer and degenerative illness is the number one cause of bankruptcy in the state. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Recently, I learned that. The number one cause of bankruptcy is the money needed and used to pay medical bills. And unfortunately, that the majority of that for most people is towards the end of their life when they're not working and they're not that productive. But any, any investment... Actually, sorry, I should also say it's unfortunately normally not covered by the health fund. Independent of what the health fund is, mm. if someone has cancer, sorry, new drugs, new this, chemo, whatever, we can't think that, oh, I'm going to not look after myself that someone else is going to pay for it. We actually have to think, no, I'm going to invest in my, my health today but through money, 
through time and education to enjoy a high quality of life and a longer life with a nice ending. You know, a life should end the same way a globe, you know, a light globe finishes when it's done its job. It's, it's shining brightly and then it just doesn't, doesn't shine again, does it? It's mm. not a globe that a little, little bit by little bit and gradually loses its shine. You know, that's, and that's what we're doing. We're too young. We're too young now that we're losing our shine. We're losing our vital energy. And it goes on for years or decades. And we think that medicine's successful in prolonging our lives. No, it's not. It's actually successful in keeping us alive longer. But that doesn't say at all what sort of quality of life we're enjoying in that time, you know. So these things we're talking about are vital. They're so important. And, you know, whether it be emotional, whether it be in a movement sense, physical or chemical, meaning the things that we're ingesting, those three factors need to be focused if we, we want to enjoy the best lives possible. For sure. And just this chat with you right now, Jason, makes me think that maybe I need to get some coaching from you in terms of, hey, this is the exercise I want to have, that, like this is the state of well-being I want to achieve, and then you know, what exercise do I need, what nutrition do I need, and all that to kind of almost prescribe it or like, you know, work it all out. So maybe we need to have a, a further conversation later, Jason. Uh, my pleasure. You know what, what excites me is the fact that I used to think the same way. Mm. You know, I was a crazy guy that ran also every day, flogged myself, thinking that I could train off a bad diet, thinking that duration equated to gain, um, and I'd, I'd, I'd train through pain. And then you start to realize and study this. Like, if you want to learn more about it, go on to, to YouTube and do, a, like, watch some TED Talks on mm. um, marathon running, or not even marathon running, but, you know, shorter distance, long distance running. And these talks are done by cardiologists who were marathon runners who are there saying, hey, you know what? No way, never again. The damage wow. to the fibre of my heart is irreparable, and I wish I knew this sooner. Our bodies yeah. aren't meant for that sort of exercise. Maybe I need Maybe to watch that. I ran a marathon last year, <laughs> so, and I've been thinking about doing them again. So maybe I need to watch those TED Talks. Well, mate, yeah. And look, as a sports physician, I'm not even talking about the effect on our joints. Like what I'll do when I receive a new patient, I've got two scales and I'll put the person on the scales and I'll measure how their weight's falling between both sides. And um, many people, like the majority of people, have a difference between what's going on the left side to the right side. Now you put that person on a road running 10, 20 Ks with one or two kilos more or sometimes more weight mm. and let's say you know, up to 5% of their weight falling on the left side or the right side, and it's really easy to understand why the joints on the left side are going to wear out faster or why when they get to a certain age, why is it that the left knee is arthritic but the other right knee is fine or the left hip but not the right? So they're just the things that we've got to realise also when we're, we're doing something that, you know, at a certain age in life it's okay, but if it's not done properly, it's only later on that we'll realise that then we'll really regret not having this information younger. Mm. Yeah, yeah, nice one. Speaking of, speaking of that information, as I said before, I, I need to do some further digging to figure out, man, if I'm not going to go for these long distances anymore, then then what's next for me? Because I like having that challenge. But um, Jason, I feel like we could keep talking all day. Again, this is a, a big interest of mine at the moment in terms of trying to dial in my own well-being and nutrition um, physical well-being, um, mindset, mental health, all of that. Again, you know, I feel like we could, we could keep going all day, but you've been very generous with your time already. And so if our listeners would like to get in contact with you to find out even more about this stuff and just to connect with you and see what you're up to, what would be the best way for them to do so? Mate, um, my Facebook, okay, Jason Gilbert, they'll find me there. That's always mm -hmm. a good way. Instagram, uh, Wellbeing Jace. I think my name is uh, Jason Gilbert underline there. Or even my phone number, I don't know if I can leave that, but if it's important enough, they can send me a message. And that's 0451 698 763. Look, I get a lot of questions and I answer all of them. Uh, and they're, they're exactly these sort of questions because people are starting to learn that certain things and certain paradigms that they've been following really might be incorrect. And they're mm. aware that by continuing to follow them, they can have really serious consequences on their health. So... It's always a pleasure to help people. And as you said before, we could talk about it all day. And at our workshops and retreats, that's exactly what we do. You know, it's two days of immersion and, and a follow-up. Because a lot of people go to a retreat and they're excited, but then it's all forgotten when they go back to normal life. But 
People need coaches. You know, that's what I see. A, you don't see a footy coach get there at the start of the year and say, okay, guys or girls, sorry, I should say footy or never or whatever, but guys and girls will do this. Uh, when we get to the end of the season, um, good luck. Hope to see you in the final. No, they're there three, four <laughs> times a week. Yeah. You know, so who says that the right paradigm for our health is, you know, doing our best until symptoms come, going to a doctor who's very well-meaning, but within the, mer- the medical paradigm, it's a paradigm that will basically wait for symptoms to appear and then suppress them, as opposed to learning more about it now and getting someone to help you along the way to go longer and not wait for those unnecessary diseases and symptoms to come along to start to think about your health. Mm. Yeah, so if any of our listeners, if any of the Do Life Better community um, would like to get in contact with you, Jason, then to ask those questions and go to your retreats, all your contact details will be in our show notes. So Do Life Better community, go check out the show notes. All the details will be in there. Um, Now, Jason, as you know, I like to ask all of our guests two questions at the end of each episode. And it's always great to hear their perspective on these questions, given their own experience and their own backgrounds. So the first one, Jason, for you is, what does doing life better, what does that mean to you? Okay, doing life better is basically, for me, living my life in a way that allows me to get the maximum that I can out of everything that I do. Mm-hmm. Like Meaning that, you know, if I'm, uh, my life purpose, for example, so important, so it should be congruent with my life purpose and allow me to do that. Now, as we just mentioned, health, one of those things. So doing life better would be looking after my health sufficiently well enough to be able to improve that or allow me to do it. Um, and also remembering that it's uh, important to look at on an emotional, physical and chemical level. So that would be, you know, incorporating practice like meditation, yoga, breath work, uh, the right sort of diet, learning what the toxins are that I need to avoid. For example, choosing a natural personal hygiene product over a chemical one, whatever it is. And then lastly, you know, choosing the right sort of exercise. But those are my three non-negotiable, you know, factors for doing what I do in my life better for sure. Awesome. Thank you. And then if you could give our listeners one challenge for this week, one thing that they can start doing or continue doing to help them do their life even better, what would be your challenge? Okay. Well, we've spoken a little bit about it. So why don't we just go back to breakfast? And I challenge Mm -hmm. everybody when they get up to drink at least a litre of water. Okay. If they have a blender, put a lemon in there, a piece of ginger, I love putting garlic in because it's a natural antibiotic and lemon actually um, totally covers up any odour or, you know, I guess, yeah, the odour side of the garlic. Mm-hmm. Um, so start that, do that for a week. Skip brekkie, okay? Or at least, if they can't skip it, just put it back an hour every day. Everyone can go an hour longer in the morning without eating brekkie. Now, if that means not eating at home but needing to eat somewhere else, we'll prepare it beforehand. So that, you know, on your lunch break or morning tea break or whatever at work, you can have that. Um, but then that's, that's basically my challenge for everyone, to be able to turn around at the end of the week and go, hey, you know what? Wow, I went really well without eating. I didn't feel hunger. I wasn't a slave to my hunger. Um, I lost a kilo or two, because people will. And I had a higher degree of mental clarity. Awesome. I'm going to try that. So lemon, ginger and garlic. Yeah, I throw some turmeric in there and I put coconut oil in that That's because good. coconut oil helps the absorption of the turmeric. So you can also mess around with that. Like um, I have liquid herbs that I put in there, um, mm-hmm. Swedish bitters, for example, for digestion or other herbs that you might be taking, like a liver tonic, dandelion or golden seal or something like that. You can actually put them in that drink at that time because the lemon is that strong and that effective of sort of overpowering the taste or odor of any anything else mm-hmm. and it's just a great way to great time of day to get into your body nice. so how much lemon do we need then i uh, just one lemon a whole lemon oh. right yeah lemon's amazing it's alkaline it's a great liver detox as i said one of the most important detox methods is just hydration and urinating more you know clearing those toxins out that have built up overnight so we don't hydrate enough in the morning we're not doing that and we, we're following that through. Look, other people tell me, and it's the same with my experience, that will actually activate my my bowels so that it makes people regular. And that is a big problem. If people aren't going regularly to the toilet, 
okay, to defecate, that is a huge possibility for the build-up of toxins in the body. Mm. There's another benefit. Yeah. Well, Jason, this is awesome. Uh, um, again, as I said, I could keep talking all day, um, and maybe we need to later on. Bring me in a week and tell me how you go with that challenge of the, uh, the hydration and the lemon in the morning. Yeah, mate, I will. I will for sure. Um, but yeah, and Jason, just with that, you know, like thank you for your generosity and you know, like giving your number to people, um, you know, your your openness to answering questions from from lots of the listeners. Um, you know, just your love of helping people and helping them find those little one percenters that make a massive difference for their health, for their well being, for you know, which again has a snowball effect for their relationships and their sense of positivity and happiness and everything as well in their everyday life. So Jason, thanks for your generosity to, uh, today and also for the great work you're doing um, to help lots of people out there do their life even better. So again, Jason, thank you very much. Oh mate, Dave, my absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you and congrats on, on this initiative of the podcast. Fantastic, mate. Congratulations. Awesome, Jason. Thank you very much. Well, there we go, friends. How do you think you could go with Jason's breakfast challenge, which is drinking a liter of water with lemon, ginger, and garlic for a week and skipping brekkie or at least putting it back an hour a day? How do you reckon you could go with doing that one for a whole week? Give it a crack. Let us know how it works out for you. And I hope this episode was really helpful for you. If it was, if you found a lot of value in this, please do leave a rating and a review. That'll be fantastic. And of course, make sure you share this with someone you know who's really trying to optimize their health, their well-being, and their clarity. Because if you gained a lot out of this chat, then you know they will also. So if you aren't a subscriber yet, please make sure you do and join us in the Do Love Better community on Facebook in the closed group. And it is called Do Love better community please do join us there again make sure you take a screenshot of this episode tag jason at jason gilbert underscore that's at jason gilbert underscore tag him on instagram and me too at dave Joyner and at do love better podcast so again i hope you really did enjoy this episode oh and one more thing as i mentioned at the start there has been lots of interviews back to back at the moment let me know your thoughts are you liking all the interviews or would you like me to bring back the solo rounds so please do let me know what you think And so for now, all the very best creating the day today that's just a little bit better than yesterday. And I can't wait to join you next time. Thanks again for listening to the Do Life Better podcast. And have you subscribed yet? By subscribing to this podcast, that enables you to get notifications every single time a new episode is released. In your podcast app, you can find all the show notes for every episode. And if you'd like to get in contact, you can do so via email at hello at projecthatch.com.au. That's hello at projecthatch.com.au. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast, share it with someone you think will benefit from these messages. And now it's time to get out there and do life better.